Welcome, ladies, to the Real Estate Investor Show, providing inspiration, strategies, and insight to empower women investors to live balanced and financially free lives. Now, here are your co-hosts, Liz and Andressa. On today's episode, we have Kalani Blackwell. She has such a diverse background from flipping over 500 properties to commercial real estate, which is focused on multifamily investing. We talked about deal flow. We talked about the pressure that many women are facing right now, many are for the first time, right? The economy is changing and how can we tap into the power of a community to handle that pressure, but also to leverage one another's experience and thrive in this business. Great strategies that she share here, and you cannot miss this episode. Welcome back, ladies. This is Liz. And this is Andressa. Welcome back to the Real Estate Invest Her Show, where our mission, our passion, what gives us life is to empower women to live a financially free, and balanced life. Do that day in and day out, right, Andressa? Yes, indeed. Whatever balance means to you. Correct. Correct. We are so excited to have Kalani Blackwell on our show here today. Excited to have you on. Excited to jump into your experience and your wisdom. So thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me. I'm so honored. Thank you so much. So Kalani, we like to start with a big question. What lesson has taken you the longest to learn? Oh my gosh. So what's funny, it's funny that you asked me that because I literally just started having this revelation in the last few weeks. And it's something that I've known. And I think we know this, but I hadn't really fully accepted it or stepped into it, so to speak. But the lesson that's taken me the longest to learn is that I already possess everything that I need. And I think a lot of times as we're progressing in our professional career and our personal lives, we often aspire to things or see what others have or think I need a certain connection or think I need a certain relationship or I need someone to put me on or I need somebody to plug me in. And that's all helpful and that's all good and well, but it doesn't mean anything if it's not in alignment with where you're meant to be or where you're trying to go. And so once I actually realized my own power and my ability to impact people, influence people, change environments, change the energy in a room, I was like, oh my God, I can do this. I already have everything that I need. So I don't need anyone to do anything for me. I can do it. So I think that's probably the lesson that's taken me the longest to learn. That, that's very powerful, right? And it doesn't really matter if you're starting out, if you're on your third, 10th flip, or if you're raising multi-million dollar deals, it's always that. And I think that what I would blame is a system that told us for the, uh, the longest period of time ever that we need to have the knowledge and knowledge equals action. And then we depend on, on that knowledge in order for us to feel that we have it, or we need to have X amount of years of experience in order to deserve to speak or to feel good about it. And I love what you're saying, because I believe that, that we were born with everything that we need, right? We have a purpose in this life. And when we are really owning that, yeah. I wanted to, to get started because you have a beautiful full journey and your Thank experience you. flipping houses, you flip over 400. Did I get the number right? Probably closer over to 500. I, I have to go back and look at the exact number, but it was over 500. It's a lot of contractors. There's a lot of toilets. It's a lot of details on, oh, on that. Looking so back, weird. what are the biggest mistakes that you had made? So the very first one, if I'm being super humble, open, and transparent, is that I made a lot of people a lot more money than I made myself. Mm -hmm. And that's because that was one of the first things that, it's how I learned the business when I got into fix and flip. So I, I we can, I guess, briefly talk about the story, but yeah, I was the first non-family member hired onto a very small family team. There was four of us when I started and they had come into some access to a lot more capital. 
and I had corporate structure. So I'm like, let's, we had to scale. We had to put this money to work. And so I created almost, you know, all these different positions and built out this team to facilitate this level of production, right? And because that's how I really learned the business, I also, at that point, I was really young. I wasn't aware of my own value. And so my first mistake is understanding that I made a lot of other people a lot more money than myself. And also didn't really recognize at the time how I should have been building my own portfolio at the same time. I don't know that that was a mistake, more so a lesson. But again, you know, I had to go through it in order to learn that, especially when I got into the business at that point in time, there weren't a bunch of gurus talking about fixing and flipping there. You know, the Internet and the information is not what it is today. Now, there was a lot readily available, but I also I didn't know that I was brand new to the business when I jumped into fixing. So that's number one. The second thing I would say that I learned, and I say this with a lot of just gratefulness of the experience that I had, was because we didn't really lose very much. We, I think we lost on two or three of our deals uh, in total. So, you know, obviously we're net positive a lot of the time, but one of the biggest mistakes I think we made was relying on the MLS to find deals too much because I was licensed and we also operated on market. We didn't fully build out the pipeline of deal flow that we should have because, again, I didn't know the wholesale space. I'm, I'm working on market. I'm doing what, you know, I'm navigating how I knew how to. I also didn't realize that there was so much more off-market opportunity and controlling that deal flow meant we controlled a lot. So I didn't know that early on, but I ended up learning that. Then the third thing I would say is everyone understands what it means to manage contractors. So you really have to have a thumb on your contractors because, I mean, even contractors can take from one job to pay for things on another and this, that, and the third. And we know that contractors really don't make money until the last 10 to 20 percent of the fee that they collect, right? So holding on to that, making sure the job gets done in the right way and making sure that the contractors are managing their resources and people correctly, that's a whole job in itself. That is a whole job in itself. And, it, and it, <laughs> it's actually critical, right? Follow-up question to the pipeline for deal flow. I think that's a big challenge for women right now. Deal flow is always important, but the options of deal flow and how you set yourself for success does change and does alter depending on the economy, depending on what's happening. So I'm curious to get a sense of like diving into that when you said, OK, I don't think we can you know, rely as much on the on market. We need to be doing much more off market. You know, what were some tactical things that you did as a team to set yourself up for success? Because it just doesn't happen overnight. And there's mm -hmm. processes and systems that have to get set up and relationships form. So just curious, what were some of those things that you you did right when you were like, OK, we got to build that pipeline and more on the off market side? Absolutely. So the one of the really cool things about wholesaling in particular, and what I think people learn from the internet is very normal, strategic, you know, get the data, market to the data, you know, and it's volume based. All that is true. But one of the things that I really credit my team on is creating a proprietary system to where inbound leads ended up coming in, right? Not just this hardcore grassroots cold outreach. So we created a system where people were calling us inbound. So for all of the houses that we had that were being flipped, first of all, we, this was bending the rules definitely, but we put four sale signs in front of them before like the day we started construction. And we also put riders on those signs that not only is it for sale, but if you have a house that you would like to sell, you, you know, reach out to us. We also leverage those same listings to get in good with the neighbors. Like when you actually have a property that's being renovated or you have a project, an active project, you should be using that to market and solicit business for additional deals and projects. So that for us was a game changer. Yeah, it's an awesome tip. Thank and you. I think, <laughs> yes, I think the marketing piece is huge and, and that could be, uh, everyone listening, you can use that tip for everything. So when you're giving a presentation, everything's a marketing opportunity. If done in the right way, not to like, I'm just going to talk about myself for all, you know, for the next 45 minutes, but Everything's an opportunity if you use it properly, a boot tour, a tour of your property. Everything's a marketing opportunity if you use it that way. I think Absolutely. that's a really good point of what you're saying. Thank you. The other thing we did, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this, is to create really good relationships with realtors because realtors oftentimes don't understand how to 
create other exit strategies for clients who are in distress, right? Realtors typically think very on market. I was really, really big on educating realtors on how the investment side of things work and use me, use us, use our team, use our company as a resource. So when you encounter a client or somebody that's in distress, you have another option for them. And that meant engage us sooner, right? Before you even went on market. And we got crazy deals that way. That's awesome. One thing that, that we we did as well is to invite the neighbors, personally invite the neighbors mm-hmm. to come to the open house, right? And they have friends, you know, do I want my best friend to move next door? Hell yeah, I do want that. For so sure. even during construction, especially during construction, right? You want to make sure that all the neighbors are comfortable. You want them on your team. You don't want them on on the other side of the fence, right? We have had several situations where the neighbors themselves wanted to purchase the property because they're seeing what's possible in a house that is just like theirs. And we've seen that time and time again. And just because they want the information, just because they want to be a little bit nosy, just because they want to see inside and dream and whatever. I mean, that's that's deal flow. It it, it turns into deal flow. It turns into them referring somebody. It turns into, you know, my son needs a house. My kids need a house. My sister's need something. It just, it's a snowball effect. And that's the really cool thing about being in the space. And I think when, for people who are just starting, it's the first transaction is always the hardest. The first deal sourcing it, it's always the hardest. It's Murphy's law. You're going to run into every problem you can run into on your first couple of deals. But if you weather that storm, it's a compound effect. It's like a snowball. And the farther it rolls down the hill, the more mass it's going to accumulate. And that's, that's how this business works too. So let's transition from in your journey, you flip hundreds of uh, houses and you decided to move to commercial properties. Mm -hmm. Share with us, why did you make that decision at at that time and what you gain from being in that niche person? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's really when my eyes started to open. Because transacting is transacting, right? There are some fundamental skills that you take with you once you've done a certain amount of transactions, regardless of how big or small they are. You know, kind of going back to what I had previously said, I was making a lot of people a lot of money. I knew there was more efficient ways to touch more money, more doors. And so once I realized that CBRE is, you know, arguably the biggest and best in the world, and then I also realized that it wasn't very diverse. So there was a lot of opportunity there. And then I also realized this is really where wealth is created. I was sold. I was like, okay, time to move to the next level. And so I did that. Joined CBRE, learned as much as I possibly could in as short of amount of time as possible. So multifamily being the the asset class that I learned, I don't even want to say first, really it's the only one that I've I've learned well even though I think a lot of the fundamentals across asset classes are the same. It's also where I think the buzz is right now. Everybody knows that multifamily is one of the safest asset classes to invest in, even still in a market like this today. When you got into the multifamily space, though, and and, and obviously right now to to, to date, multifamily is a and that's what we're involved in. Right. And it's a it's an interesting business right now. You know, during during COVID, right, there was tons of opportunities. Interest rates were amazing. I mean, some of our best deals were bought during then. And and now you're at a point where pricing hasn't come down quite a bit and it's still competitive and the numbers aren't working for a lot of projects and you're getting outbid. So a lot of people that are multifamily investors are like, okay, is there something else that we can redeploy? It's a lot of the conversation that I've heard and I'm involved in as well, or we're involved in. So I'm curious to get your insight into to the kind of the state of multifamily. It's still something that is endured. It's a phenomenal investment. No one would disagree with that. But now it, it's got some, you got to work a little harder. You got to work a little differently to get deals done. So what would you say to, to the women listening? Is this the time to kind of hold off? Is this the time to kind of double down? Do they need to change their strategy? Like what, what advice would you give them now? So a couple of things. It's funny that you say this because I was just having this conversation yesterday. We do this webinar once a month. It's called The Truth Behind the Headlines. And it's where we literally debunk all of some of the news headlines that might make you think differently than what's actually happening. 
And what I have gathered at this point is that we haven't seen the worst of it yet. So to, to answer your question directly, what advice would I give to an investor trying to take down deals right now? Stick to the numbers. Everyone's feeling what you're feeling. So the only difference between you and the person bidding next to you is how well capitalized they are and their risk tolerance. That's it. So at this point in time, you know, you know the same big bank takes little bank, right? The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. What's happening right now is that that gap is widening and institutions are doing what institutions have always done. And, because, and that's, you know, be competitive and take up everything when the storm hits. That's what they're going to continue to do. So with commercial values in particular, let, well, let's not even say commercial values, it, multifamily values in particular, I think that they're holding strong, but I do think that we are going to see a decline in valuations. I do believe that. I also think that there's going to be a lot of, well, the reason is, is that there's going to be a lot of opportunity because just like you said, people are having to work to do deals now. You're having to exercise real skill. Anybody two years ago, you could rub two pennies together Correct. and find a deal make a deal, find investors or whatever. So I think the, the people that were really new to the business, everyone thought they could create a syndication, raise some money, go take down some assets. And you could, people should know that that is a real thing. That is a, a way to start to create wealth, grow your portfolio. That's all very, very true. What people didn't account for is what we're going through right now. And so people that were unsophisticated in their underwriting who didn't plan for interest rates to really creep up on them. Now their cash flow and their reserves are being eaten up, understandably so. But the people that have been seasoned and have been around have underwrote conservatively and were had a very, very close watch on the market and refinanced before debt got too crazy, right? So but I feel so terrible for the people who didn't underwrite well, who recently acquired, or for people who had debt coming due that didn't act when they still could get good terms. Because people are in those situations, there will be opportunity. Those people really may not have any other option but to sell or but to exit and take a haircut. And those are the opportunities that we're looking for. If I'm, a, if I'm an investor now, I'm looking at those opportunities and you have to stick to your numbers. Just because a deal comes available doesn't make it a really, really good deal. You have to be able to weather the storm and adjust your pro formas and your expectations with your investors of what our returns might look like, how long it might take to get them, how much CapEx do I need to deploy right now to, and is it realistic to say I want to increase rents or that rents are going to continue to increase when really, you know, renters are having a hard time too. Inflation is real. Concessions are real. So are we underwriting conservatively and stick to those numbers? Yeah. Isn't that so I love, true? I love what you said. When a deal comes through, it doesn't mean it is a deal. But uh, what I want to emphasize is that the pitfalls, right? If somebody that started in the pandem during the pandemic and started already raising money and doing that, a person that is reliant on her own experience and resources, now you're freaking out inside your head. And the third piece is the pressure, the emotional, right? You're having a pressure right now to get deals under your belt. And because you're not used to do not have deals under your belt, you're feeling behind and therefore softening up the numbers or praying for dear life that the yeah. interest rate is not going to raise the, the worst case scenario. So those are like, three major things. So all about that, I would say community is the answer for you. If you're going to rely on your own experience that you just had two or three years, that's not enough to ride this wave that it's, we are in it, right? And, and it's right. going to get bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. So I think that now is the, the time to rely on, on a community of women. And I know you have created also a community to support women. And I, I wanted you to share the reasons why you decided to, to create and support women in real estate. Absolutely. You, you hit the nail on the head. Before I answer that question, I want to comment on what you just said because you made a really, really great point. Nobody has a crystal ball. But what we do know in the fundamentals of real estate, whoever has access to deal flow has the advantage. So mm. if you want to 
be in a situation where you're competing with a bunch of people for an apartment building, I don't know, whatever, then you're going to have a hard time and you're going to want to feel like maybe you need to fudge the numbers a little bit or see where you can flex to try to meet whatever, whatever goals or whatever targets to make whatever offer. But really, I think if that's what the situation you find yourself in a lot of the times, and you need to really reconsider how you're getting access to deal flow. And if you haven't already created a machine to where you're going direct to seller, you might want to do that. Um, I love that. I just need to reiterate that. So ladies that are not listening, that maybe just are starting to listen. If you have access to deal flow, you will have the advantage. If you have to reduce advice in today's economy to one thing, it would be that. So if you don't have any deal flow, that's the problem to solve in order to have the advantage in today's market, quite honestly, in any market, especially today. So I just need to say that because it's like put a put an explanation point on that so you can continue. <laughs> any market, any asset type, and it doesn't matter. It does not matter. And then here's the next hack. Even if the deal doesn't work for you, control it and find someone who it does work for. There you go. That's it. So, okay, I'll get off that soapbox. That's one of my favorite things to talk about. <laughs> so let's go on the, the your mission and why you <laughs> created a group to support women. Share more okay. about it. Yes. So you guys are in such alignment with what what we've got going on over here. And I think that that's probably why this is such a great conversation. But everything that you just said is exactly why we decided to create this community. Now, what I will say is it organically happened. It fell in my lap. So for your listeners or anyone in your audience, I have no idea who I am, which is not surprising because I just am new to this social media space or this influencer space. I went viral on an app called Clubhouse during the pandemic. I was an early adopter of Clubhouse. I was very quiet on that platform for a few weeks until I heard a woman just getting really crap advice, insert cuss word on the level (laughs) of crap advice, right, that this woman was getting. So that was the first time I had ever raised my hand to ask to contribute to a conversation. And then, of course, it's like, well, who are you? What do you do? Oh, you're a broker at CBRE. Okay. and so. I just started getting invited to every room, every conversation that I was able to, you know, contribute to and really just use my voice to make sure that women were heard and respected. So I very soon, very quickly got this like spicy reputation. I don't know if the algorithm gods were just on my side or what, but I ended up gaining a bunch of followers on this platform. Then I met my now business partner and co-founder of Women in Real Estate. Her name's Brittany. I created the club on Clubhouse, and I think uh, now to this day, it's still ranked number two for top real estate club on the entire platform with nearly 70,000 members. And it happened organically. I'm like, who who wants to hear what I have to say? Why Mm -hmm. do people care about what I, I'm, I'm still working. I'm still figuring it out. And I had to get over that really, really quickly because I realized that I have experienced more than most. And I had information that could drastically impact someone's life. And I was being selfish by not sharing that. Mm. So when we created the club, we went crazy on socials, essentially. And we were getting asked to mentor people. Can you coach me? Can you mentor me? And I'm like, no, I'm not a guru. I'm not selling you a course. I'm not. No. (laughs) And then Finally, the demand for it, though, just became so overwhelming. So Brittany and I sat down and we said, we don't want to do a course. We don't want to be internet gurus. Like, how can we actually help people? And so we decided to create a community instead. And so it started off as a little mastermind. We took our first like 10 people and we said, okay, let's meet, you know, twice a month, talk about what we're experiencing. Then it was like, okay, first of all, this isn't even scalable. How, how do we turn this into something? We, can, we need to accommodate some more people because now we have a wait list. So we ended up, again, turning it into a community. We created the for-profit company, Women in Real Estate, and we have now a membership continuity product, essentially, where we meet virtually uh, several times a month. But in places where we have high concentrations of members, we now have local chapters in eight markets across the country. And we have chapter leaders in those local markets that host our quarterly events. And then we also host about three nationally scaled events every year. And Brittany and I spend our time just traveling, supporting our members in any way possible. So what's really cool about our community is that we have members that do 
all different things in real estate at all different levels. You know, the business fundamentals are pretty consistent. But just like you guys said, when we got on, I think maybe before we hit record, you said this is a a deep environment, right? Like we give space to the fact that women are caretakers and they are responsible for other people and they are working jobs and yet still trying to figure out how to create wealth all at the same time. So we create, we give and lend support not only in the real estate space, but personally too. We focus a lot on personal development, brand development. We bring experts in to teach on a multitude of different subjects. And that's really to give people a lot of the exposure. So are we a place to learn everything you need to know about real estate? Not necessarily, but we are the place where you can implement all of the things that you learn in the world, bring it back to this community and support group and say, okay, hey guys, I'm working on this project. I need help with my underwriting or hey, I'm having a hard time negotiating this deal. We have created that support system. That's great. Thank you, Kalani. We we do uh, share a lot of similarities, like women just getting bad information, right? And how do we you know, shift the ships to, to really ensure women are getting what they need and want to grow wealth on their own terms. So yes. Where can the ladies listening learn more about you? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, first of all. If you guys want any information on women in real estate, you can head to our official website, which is joinwomeninrealestate.com or on Instagram, women.in.realestate. Um, I'm on all socials as Kalani B. That's K-E-L-A-N-I-B. Feel free to tap in with me. And then also, we've got some really cool intentional um, investment strategy and opportunities coming up for our members. So now is you know is still a good time to to get involved because we're still really in our infancy. You know, God put women in real estate, or we call it wire, in our laps, and it's still so early that you know, getting involved at this point, at this level is only going to um, give you access to some opportunities that are only going to be available for people here now. Because as we continue to grow, and I know you guys see this in your brand and with your company, with Invest Her, as you guys are growing and learning and evolving, you're touching more people. And as something grows, you know, we're trying to maintain the culture as best as we can right now, but as it grows, it's going to grow. So get involved now, find a community to support you. Thank you, ladies, for having me. Awesome. All this information you guys can find on our show notes. Now we're going to transition to our fabulous three questions. And the first one is, what's the most transformational book you ever read? Ooh, most transformational book I've ever read, probably Think and Grow Rich. Awesome. Second question is, what's the most powerful routine that you do to create a financially free and balanced life, whatever balance me to you? Unconventional, not really particular to business, but in life in particular, I have learned how to get still. I am a woman of faith. And one of the big important things to me is understanding how to rest and hear the voice of God so that I know what he wants me to do. And if you don't get still enough, if you are overcome by the culture of the world, which would tell you to grind, hustle, don't sleep, get money, get to the bag, whatever, you are really going to miss what is intended for you. So biggest part of my routine that I am learning, I have to actively practice this because it's so easy to get overwhelmed and to get into the routine of your work, but you have to actively practice stillness. I love this so much. Last question. Which woman, famous or not, has inspired you the most? Ooh, there are so many. How I'm feeling today, oh, someone I'm super inspired by is one of my best friends and business partners. Her name's Patty Goodspeed. She's who I do that webinar with. She is a single mother of two. She's also a top 100 mortgage banker in the United States. And she is inspiring me every day, showing me that the limits that I ever thought were exist, I, that I thought existed do not exist. So big shout out. To, to Patty. She's on that list for me. Now, there are so many influential women in my life, spiritually, personally, professionally. This week is Patty Goodspeed. Last week, I was really on a Beyonce kick. Week before, <laughs> week I before, it. I was really on a, an Oprah kick, a Michelle Obama kick. So it, it kind of just depends. But seeing that it's possible is, is what 
what matters. And so I'm really addicted and attracted to being around people that can show you what's possible. Love that. Kalani, thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you for all that you do and appreciate your time so much and sharing your wisdom with our community. Thank you so much. You, you ladies are fantastic. And thank you for doing the work that you're doing to impact women in our community. It's, it's really, really big. There's a special place in the world for people like you. So thank you. Thanks so much. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to receive updates on our next interviews, go to our website, therealestateinvestor.com. There, you can subscribe to our show, become part of our investor community, and get updates on upcoming episodes. If you like our show, please share it with other women who would benefit. And don't forget to leave us a rating on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. And as always, we encourage you to take one action as a result of today's show and put it into motion so you can live both a financially free and balanced life. Thanks for spending time with us. Ciao.